<clears throat> All right, everybody. Sorry, I am very coffee dependent on this uh, Sunday when I'm creating this video for you. So, all right. So this is your chapter five um, lecture from me, sort of, I guess you could call it. Um, and I apologize. This angle is all weird and I'm getting glare off my glasses. I apologize. Um, so this is your uh, chapter five uh, kind of lecture assignment from me. Because I did not quiz you on chapter five, I want to make sure that you are understanding what we're talking about in chapter five. So what I am looking at is in your textbook, your online textbook in chapter five, I'm looking at the five one theories of development. That's where I am and where I'm at. Um, so I wanted to just talk for a little bit here about, um, I'm actually scrolling down to the sociological theories of, of self-development um, and into kind of the ideas of, of Kohlberg. But, you know, this chapter is about how we learn what we know. What do we know about ourselves? What do we know about the world around us? What do we know about the world's expectations of us? That's what socialization is. So whether it's, you know, gender socialization or it's just self-socialization or whatever it is, that's what we're looking at. So when we look at some theories of self-development, you know, you've got Mead that really looked at the person's distinct identity. Um, and he was really looking at how people become themselves. But that's hard because he kind of crossed over into some psych stuff. Um, but, you know, he he wanted to know how do we go from newborns, you know, to being humans with themselves. Um, and he was looking at how people go through things, um, you know, basically how how we go through things from childhood to adults, um, you know, and, and he was a lot on play. Um, but really where I'm going to talk today is a couple of things. I'm going to talk about Kohlberg for a minute um, and then Carol Gilligan right after that. Um, and then we'll talk about some of your own socialization. So Kohlberg moral development. So Kohlberg is a theorist who is insanely biased. Um, Kohlberg studied moral development, but he studied how people process it, how people um, think about a, a moral decision that they're going to make. Um, he And why he's so biased is because the people on which his um, theory is based were all white men. So, hello, that's extremely biased. Um, you know, but I think there's, even though it's extremely biased, as most research is, I think there's some value in where he was going. Um, so what Kohlberg did was he would create um, a, a scenario. He would ask, ask his subjects a scenario, and he wanted to know, you know, what they thought should happen. So the most famous one is what's called the Heinz Dilemma. And Heinz, um, I'm going to move this over here because it's the glare is starting to bug me, so forgive me. Um, okay, so Heinz... The Heinz Dilemma is a story that he would ask people. So he would say, um, okay, so there was this man, Heinz, whose wife was dying of cancer. And um, there was a drug that had been created in town. And the local druggist um, had this drug. And, and the doctors thought this drug could save Heinz's wife. And Heinz, the, the druggist was making the drug and charging uh, 10 times what it costs to make. Heinz could get together about half of the money and he went to the druggist and asked if he could um, sell him the drug cheaper or take what he had and let him pay the rest later. And the druggist said no. So the um, so Heinz got desperate, broke into the pharmacy and stole the drug for his wife. So Kohlberg would, you know, there was those kind of like moral uh, scenarios. And then what Kohlberg would do is ask the subject, okay, should Heinz have stolen the drug and why or why not? Okay. Um, and so there's not really a right or wrong answer, but what he was looking at was how do people, um, how did they think through things? How did they, um, 
you know, how did they process what was right and wrong? And he came up with three levels of a pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional, um, you know, idea. And the pre-conventional would be in general, smaller children who would say something like, no, you can't steal the drug because it's wrong. Or, you know, uh, the, you, there's, uh, uh, you know, you'll get in trouble. Um, a conventional answer would be, you know, something like, um, you, you, he stole the drug because then people couldn't look at him as a bad person that they would look at him and, and they would say that he tried everything to save his wife, or they might say, you know, no, you, um, you shouldn't steal the drug because we have laws against that. A post-conventional thought is much more of an abstract thought, which is probably where most of you are, um, you know, in this idea of, okay, well, no, we really shouldn't, shouldn't steal a drug, but this and but that and whatever. Um, I actually gave you a link to the to a YouTube video that is kind of explains Heinz Dilemma a little bit more. So make sure that you watch that. And then your first answer on this assignment, uh, what I want you to do is think about the Heinz Dilemma. Um, think about what that scenario is and just tell me what you think. Should Heinz have stolen the drug and why or why not? Again, there's not any right or wrong answer. But, you know, tell me, what do you think? Should Heinz have stolen the drug and why or why not? And then look at your answer and, and think, does it fall in pre-conventional, conventional, or post-conventional? Again, there's not a right or wrong answer here. So don't, don't try to make up an answer that you think I want to hear. Just tell me what you think. So that's the first part of this um, assignment is to do that. Um, so then I'm going on and looking at, again, in that chapter, um, the ideas of Carol Gilligan. And, and Gilligan looked at Kohlberg and, and recognized that Kohlberg had limits and recognized that he really was extremely biased. And Gilligan took the ideas of, of what Kohlberg was doing and took them further by saying that women um, think about things morally differently than men do. So your textbook talks about, um, you know, that she wondered, would female subjects uh, responded differently? Would a female social science no scientist notice a different pattern? Um, she's asking very legit questions about Kohlberg's research. Um, you know, she is very critical of, of Kohlberg's research in that, you know, Kohlberg, again, is based on only male subjects. And, you know, again, you know, there is some difference in how people uh, think about things. So that's kind of what Gilligan talked about. But then if you scroll down at the bottom of that 5-1 theory section, it talks about sociology in the real world. And it talks about what a pretty little lady and it says, you know, what a cute dress. I like the ribbons in your hair. Wow, you look so pretty today. And, you know, it goes through and, and talks about uh, straight talk for women and how women are, are uh, talked down to, how, um, you know, that this, this author, Lisa Bloom, asserts that we are too focused on the appearance of young girls. And as a result, our society is socializing them to believe that how they should look is of vital importance. Okay, maybe. Um, you know, and Bloom may be onto something. How often do you tell a little boy how attractive his outfit is? Good point. Um, now, you might say, I like your shoes, but do you say, wow, you are so handsome today. Probably not. She's not wrong in thinking that. Um, you know, that that this has been a continuous thing with gender socialization is looking at children as young as kindergarten already having a body image, already having a negative body image of what they think they should look like. And many times some of those criticism go to the media. Um, and I know as a mom of a, of a, a boy who's almost 30 and a girl who's almost 16. Um, I, it's a very different world raising girls than it is boys. Um, you know, I, I don't have to deal with trying to find shorts for my, my son when he was growing up, the shorts were always long. They were never too short. Um, you know, they were, you know, but 
you know, it was dinosaurs and it was trucks and it was, you know, solid color shirts where trying to shop for my daughter, you know, she and I battle every single day about, you know, what is out there and um, it's hard. You know, it's, she's tall. So it's even harder to, um, you know, for example, find shorts that are not super short. Um, not because she's intentionally buying them that way, but that's what's out there. Um, you know, when we, when we look at things that are being marketed to girls, um, that's a whole other thing. Um, you know, so, and we, we could do an entire semester on, on the sociology of gender and gender socialization and what's out there and what we say to our girls and what we say to our boys and how that's different. What I want you to do for question, the second question on this is I want you to give me an example or two or five. Um, actually, give me two. Try to think of two examples of something that was said to you that really was implying that you were a certain gender or that you should act that act a certain way because you were assigned a certain biological sex at birth. So for example, did somebody say to you, you know, oh, you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't do this. I know um, uh, I was shocked when my dad made a comment to my daughter about, um, and she was, she was joking. She, she's not a, a kid that would want to play football, but um, I was shocked when my dad said, but football's for boys. I was shocked. I'm like, wait a minute, you raised two daughters. Um, you know, who we were encouraged to do anything. And so I started really listening to what my dad was saying to my daughter. I'm like, hmm, interesting. Um, he does say things to her that are very gender stereotypical. So I want you to think about two examples from your life where somebody said something to you that implied that you should be a certain way, act a certain way, dress a certain way because you were biologically assigned a gender at birth. Now, let me preface this as well with, I get it, guys. I know I am 110% supportive of, of gender fluidity and LGBTQ plus um, issues. I, I understand that. And if that's you, where maybe you are, um, you know, gender neutral, I'm sure you have heard things. Um, you know, I, I get that. And, um, you know, or do you, or did you grow up in a family where things were gender neutral? Share that. Um, but please don't think just because I'm asking this question and talking about gender from a, from a two category, uh, perspective that I don't acknowledge that there are other categories. I absolutely acknowledge the fluidity of gender, but I'm looking for examples that you felt were things that were said or done to you. Um, that were trying to put you in a category of how you were biologically assigned at birth. Okay. Does that make sense? So the two things, you know, make sure that you answer both questions. Yes, I know what you're supposed to do. Um, so I will be looking for those. I'm not looking for one word answers on these. I'm looking for some explanation. Um, you know, I'm looking for your, your first answer to tell me kind of in detail what you think and then why you think it is in what category? You know, the second one, I'm looking for you to be specific. Tell me how you felt about it. Why was this? Um, why do you feel that it was pushing one gender or another? Um, one or two sentences for this is not going to fly. Um, answers on this, really, you should easily be at a half a page or more total um, for answers on this. Okay? All right. That's all I got. Have a good day.